Uh, this week is uh, the 4th of July. We're celebrating the birth of our nation. I got to tell you, we are blessed indeed, aren't we? I mean, we are really blessed. It's so easy to get onto the negative. I actually can't remember a time when, when we concentrate on negative things like we do today in America. I can't, believe, can't remember a time in my short lifetime of 61 years that uh, people, uh, we, we stand as divided as we are today. And uh, there, there seems to be so much conflict around us. And it just seems to be a heaviness in the air. You know, that's not the way God intends for it to be. That's not the way that it has to be. That's the way that we have chosen for it to be. But let me again tell you, we are blessed in the... We are without any question uh, blessed beyond uh, uh, what, what we deserve to be blessed. God has touched every one of us. You say, Pastor, you don't know my individual circumstances. And I may not. You may be going through some stuff. I don't know that. But I can tell you whatever is going on in your life, we are still blessed indeed. We, we still serve a mighty God who, who can and will and does uh, supply every need that we have. It is, it, it is hard for me to separate my own personal political views from that of uh, the biblical principles and values that I find in God's Word. And the reason it is is because where biblical principles intersect with political ideas, it is that as a Christian, we are not supposed to uh, separate ourselves from it. It is that we are to stand on the Word of God. The Word of God is absolutely true. It has always been true and will always be true. And what God says, that's right, regardless of what the White House or CNN or anybody else says, God is right. And the reason America is a strong nation is because God has blessed our nation. And the reason God has blessed our nation is because our founding fathers had the wisdom and the dedication to look and seek God's direction in making decisions. And the very foundation and the very core of how America was founded and what, what, what uh, well, the very foundation of America was built on God's Word, publicly built on God's Word, unashamedly built on God's Word. And in that wisdom, America's history is just right with instances of, uh, of our founding fathers willing to, to sacrifice their personal fortune, willing to sacrifice their time and a lot of effort, willing to get on their knees publicly and declare how much we need God in America or how much they needed God's wisdom and direction in founding America and coming up with, with the, the, the plan that worked and made us the exceptional nation that we are. Now let me tell you this, we're not exceptional because we're exceptional people. In fact, we have demonstrated that we're not exceptional people. We're just people who follow the way of people. But we are have been an exceptional nation because we have an exceptional God who gave us a set of foundation, who gave us a set of rules, who gave us a set of values and principles that when you follow, it is an exceptional thing that comes out. It is the blessing. It is the strength of Almighty God Himself. Now, I believe without any question or without any reservation that America became a great nation because she was founded on values and principles found in the Word of God. We are a Christian nation. <coughs> President Obama, I would like to correct you publicly when he says that we are no longer a Christian nation. We are a Christian nation. Amen. It's not because he's a Christian or not a Christian. It's not because the number of Christians in America. It's because the values and principles that our laws and our 
our nation was built upon are found in the Christian value set of values. It's found in the Word of God. That's what makes us a Christian nation. What makes a, 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 a Muslim nation a Muslim nation is the fact that their laws and their foundations are, are built on Sharia law rather than the Word of God or rather than any other uh, uh, any other foundation. What makes another nation built upon another foundation is what it was based on in the principles and value system that their laws were created for. America is a Christian nation. America is a Christian nation because the, the uh, uh, wisdom of our forefathers, the prayers of our forefathers, and the direction of our forefathers in building our system, of our judicial system, and our laws on the Word of God. America will cease to be a Christian nation when it leaves those principles and those values. And by the way, I'm very, very concerned that we are leaving in a wholesale uh, uh, way those values and principles that have made us very strong. Now that hasn't just happened. That started in big measure back in the 1960s. It started in big measure in the 1960s when a uh, suit was filed trying to take prayer out of school. Now, when you think about it, what a logical place for Satan to work. And, and, and I'm not going to hesitate to tell you, I think this is a plot of Satan. And I think it has been opened, and I think it has been followed down to the letter. But I think it started in our public schools with our children for a reason. It has been a common knowledge or common uh, a consensus that if what, however you train a child when they are very, very young, it will be hard to take those ideas and that conditioning out of their mind. Back in the late 50s, the problems we were having in public school, chewing gum and speaking without raising your hand. Why don't you long for the days when that's some of the problems we had in school? Today, young ladies have to be afraid of being raped in public school. Today, young men and young ladies have to be afraid of opening their Bibles and, and reading, afraid of being uh, uh, chastised by their teachers and by administration, those who are supposed to be old enough to know better. Today, our children have to worry about games and violence. What we have presented to our children and grandchildren a very uh, dark situation. But it's not a hopeless situation. It's no coincidence that it started with prayer. It's no coincidence that it began to go out into the judicial system in a way, in, in a sense that uh, began to take the Ten Commandments off the wall. Can you imagine anybody being offended by words like don't commit murder? Or don't tell lies? Or don't commit adultery? I can imagine some are offended by that. Uh, can you imagine the Ten Commandments being offensive to anyone, regardless of what your relationship is with God? That's the very foundation that this world, that this uh, nation was built upon. And so they begin to take those out of the courtroom. They have moved and they have progressed in, in the way that you can pray. Today we're told that you can pray in public, but you can't pray in the name of Jesus. Have you ever wondered why there's such an attack on Jesus? Well, there's no use wondering about it. Satan hates Jesus. And he's trying to do everything he can to stop you. You can pray generically, but a generic prayer is worthless. The Bible is absolutely crystal clear. And I hope you 
get this. The Bible is absolutely crystal clear. It doesn't beat around the bush. There's no room for interpretation here. The Bible teaches us that we are to pray in the name of Jesus. And those are the prayers that God will hear. The reason is, is that Jesus becomes our advocate to the Father. Is that when we pray in Jesus' name, we are advocating, we are giving to Jesus, we are speaking to Jesus, we are talking to Him to, to intercede to the Father in our behalf so that our, our the words of this old sinful body, the words of this old sinner saved by grace, that our, our precious, holy, pure Father, pure uh, Savior will stand between us and our Heavenly Father who when God looks down and sees no sin through Jesus, He hears the words of our prayers. Amen. When it is prayed and not in the name of Jesus, there is no such advocate standing between us and the Father. So a prayer not in Jesus' name is a worthless prayer. So Satan's trying to attack by way of reason and logic. Well, you can still say your prayer, but, but just don't say it in the name of Jesus and that way it won't offend anyone. How can that possibly offend anyone? If you don't believe in Jesus, you don't have to, you, you, you're not a gun held to your head and make you accept Jesus because someone prays in Jesus' name. If you're called on to pray and you don't believe in Jesus, pray whatever way you want to. This is America. But as a child of God, if I'm called on to pray, you can better bet that I'm going to pray in Jesus' name because that's the only prayer that gets through to the Father. Amen. No wonder Satan wants to attack. No wonder he wants to rationalize and become very logical in our thinking so that we don't uh, hurt anybody's feelings. Why is it that, that about 3% of the population uh, were afraid of, of, of offending about 3% of the population? So we're going to offend 90% of the population, who, or at least 86% of the population, who say they believe in God, who say that they are uh, uh, Christian in, the, in their practice. We're much more afraid of what our neighbors might think than we are afraid of what God is going to think. And this is happening in the church with Christians. I'm concerned. I, 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 maybe just because I, I'm looking for it this way, but I can't remember a time in my 61 years that there's ever been the kind of uh, uh, news on the, the news media so much about people going in and just start shooting or taking knives or, or trying to take the lives of innocent people. Do you remember a time when it's ever been as, as bad as it's, it is today? In America, do you realize that America leads the world in murder? Do you realize America leads the world in uh, single parent homes? Do you realize that America leads the world in divorce? We seem to be really concerned about our educational system, and we all do. We're taking channels and going ways, and we're looking at things that, that, that have very little value in our children's lives, and we're, we're ignoring the things that, that matter a lot in their lives. We spend more per child on education than any other nation on the face of this earth. Now understand that. I can bring it down that we spend more for, for child for education than any other nation on the face of this earth. We spend on an average of $7,743 per year per child to be educated in the United States of America. The closest
closest nation to us is the UK. United Kingdom spends about $5,834 per child. Yet, the United States of America is ranked 10th behind the major powers in the world in mass scores with an average of 474 uh, out of a possible 600 in mass scores. We're ranked ninth behind the world powers in the world in science with a, an average of 489 out of a possible 600 score. Our literacy rate falls behind, way behind, Finland and Russia. We're throwing money at it, but we're not succeeding. Why? I can tell you why. Because the very foundation of our educational system the very foundation of our nation was built upon strong homes. When homes were strong, our schools were strong and effective. When parents disciplined in the home and taught responsibility, personal responsibility, and taught their children a work ethic, the scores then skyrocketed. It's not that way today. Look around. And it's not the children's fault. It's the home's fault. Satan has assaulted the home. He is destroying the home. He has put je the home in jeopardy. He's taken security out of the home. And when you take security out of the home, all those inside the home lose their security as well. Our children grow up in a unsecure world. Do you realize another way that we leave the world is in teen suicides? Why? Because we're bringing up our children without security, without purpose, without value to life. All the things that come into know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior gives you. All the things that that uh, being built upon the security of an unchanging truth. All the things that 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 that, that come with knowing that uh, there is love and where security comes from. Where there's a loving mom and a loving dad, daddy, or a loving guardian, at least in a home that that is guiding and leading, produces in children. We're not going to stem the tide in America until we get back to just some basics taught in the Word of God. We're not going to get back to the strength and security and, and producing children who are secure in themselves and, and who have meaning inside their life until that comes in the home again. Let me tell you something, daddies. You have a responsibility to lead your home to a place of security. And God bless the single moms who are trying to, uh, to, to teach their children and lead their children home in, into a place to know God in their lives. And they have a responsibility to take up the slack where, where daddy's not there and, and, and to lead their children to a knowledge of Jesus Christ and a security and a place of meaning and purpose in their lives through the Lord Jesus Christ. And the church is failing. The church has a responsibility to teach our young people of God's principles and values of the home and God's principles and values are right and wrong. And God's principles and values, we have a responsibility to teach that to young people so that as they become adults and as they begin to have children and in a home that they can teach those values to their children. But all of it comes around. The church is no stronger than the homes that are in the church. A school is no stronger or the children in a school are no stronger than the, the homes inside that school. A nation is no stronger than the homes inside that nation. I believe that's the very hub of the problem in America today. The home life. Throughout Scripture, God gave warning after warning after warning after warning. And then he showed us 
about consequences. Let me read some scriptures out of the book of Proverbs just real quick. But Jack, there we go. Back it up. Okay. When the righteous increase, and it's talking about the leaders in righteousness, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, the people groan. You understand what Solomon is saying there? He's saying if you've got good, godly leadership, everybody's blessed. Everybody's happy. There is a sense of security. But when you have wicked authority, when you have ungodly authority, the people are confused. The people are, are unhappy. The people are un, not content. There's, there's division inside the land. The people groan. Verse 4 says, By justice a king, a king builds up the land. A leader, a person in authority who, who leads by justice, who leads by example, but he who exacts gift, but he who imposes heavy taxation on the people so that they can live an exorbitant lifestyle, so that they can fly their dog around in a million dollar jet just so that they won't have to be in the same airplane with them. But he who exacts gifts tears it down. He tears down what the justice builds up. Take away the wicked from the presence of the king. Those who counsel the king, if they're ungodly, if you take that away from the, the authority, and his throne will be established in righteousness. Steadfast love and faithfulness preserve the king or the one in authority. And by steadfast love, his throne is upheld. When there is respect for the office, when there is respect for the leadership, when there is respect in the place of leadership, the people will, will be blessed. The people will, will thrive. The people will be happy. <clears throat> by the blessing of, of the upright city is exalted, but by the mouth of the wicked is so overthrown. A city that is led in a godly way is happy and continue. But the mouth of the wicked overthrows that contentment and takes away that security. Now let me tell you, how does America, in your own opinion, how does America stack up to what Solomon says about being blessed as a nation and about the, the leadership in America? And let me tell you something. It, it would be my tendency to, to, to throw stones at the uh, President Obama, but President Obama isn't the author of all this. I think he's being used to carry it out, but he's not the author of all this. This has been going on for some time. We have been, uh, Satan has been very active in pushing this into play and making it easy for someone to step in and to lead this direction. He has caused people in the church to say, well, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm going to vote this year. I'm just, I don't like that person. I don't like this person. I'm going to stay at the house. You vote for the sorriest one when you stay at the house, okay? That's an excuse. It's not a reason. And God won't honor you for it. You have a responsibility as a Christian to exercise your vote in a godly way. Not for the Republicans, not for the Democrats, not for the Independents are the libertarian, but those who will stand on a godly principle and be reminded that we are a great nation because we stand on the Word of God. Amen. You have a responsibility. To whom much is given, much is required. You have a responsibility as a citizen. After all the warnings are given, let me tell you about a message that President James Garfield back in 1877 had. Listen to this. Listen to the words that, that he said. James Garfield, the 20th president of the United States, gave a warning to the American people. He said, "Now more than ever before, the people are responsible." 
for the character of their Congress. That that body be ignorant, reckless, and corrupt. It is because the people tolerate ignorance, recklessness, and corruption. Let me tell you something. James Garfield was one hundred percent correct. If it be intelligent, brave, and pure, it is because the people demand these qualities to represent them in the national legislature. It's time for God's people to stand up and say, we're not going to tolerate God being taken out as the foundation of our nation. It's time for common sense and faith to be implemented again in the decisions that are made. We're not going to vote for, we're not going to support anyone who would violate these principles and these values. And we're going to hold those that we elect to these principles and values. We're going to hold their feet to the fire and be sure they do what they say. Only then will there be a change in America. financial crisis. Because we have violated the Word of God. Word of God says don't become a slave of the lender. Borrowers not become a slave of the lender. You know what that means? Don't get heavily in debt because then you are motivated by those who hold the lien against you. Is debt wrong? Not if it's managed, not completely. But when debt, when you have to go from one week to the next to pay your bills to the next, then, then you're over your head in debt. Do you realize that the United States of America is $17 trillion in debt? That's 17 and 12 zeros out here behind it. $17 trillion in debt. That means that every day, there is more than $3.7 billion added in interest alone to the national debt. How do you ever get that paid off and get out of it? That means that over $118,700 for every taxpayer, every taxpayer, owes $118,700 if we are to pay that debt off. You say, we're getting by. We are, but quit being so selfish. You got kids coming up or grandkids coming up. What are you doing to them? You're giving them such a debt that they will never be able to succeed like you succeeded in our society today. They'll never have the opportunity that you've had an opportunity. They'll be so taxed, if there is an America, they'll be so heavily taxed with everything. Do you realize it's already started? Yeah. We are told today that in, in the state of Texas and in other states too, that you do not own the water under your house and under the land that you own. It is owned by the state. And they have the right to charge you for the water that you pull up out of your well and use inside your house. You watch it. If things continue the way that they're going within three or five years, there'll be a meter put on every well uh, out in the country and you'll be charged to pull money to pull the water up. They've already established legal rights to it. One state just here a few weeks ago uh, de declared that water falling down in the rain if it's captured inside of uh, any kind of big vessel, any kind of uh, uh, tank to hold it, that that doesn't belong to you. That belongs to the state, and there is a right to place tax on it. We are told that we are able, that the government is able to place tax on absolutely anything. We are told that the government has a right to place tax, a sales tax on the pacemaker, on any kind of uh, implement or any kind of medical device that they put inside of you, they have the right to tax. Not only do they have the right, they've already passed the law to do it, to start taxing you uh, when those things have to be used or when those things have to be purchased in, in, to, to save your life. 